Hello, everybody. Welcome to class. Um, again, today is a pre recorded lecture, but you've probably already figured that out by now. Uh, <coughs> maybe actually, before we get into it, I'll give you some reminders. Um, so today is the 30th. Let's look at our syllabus together. Oh, got a couple screens going. Okay, here it is. Um, so we're moving to the end of this second part of the class, I guess. Yeah, the second half of the second part. Um, so we just did the reading response. I actually just finished grading those for your class, all the ones that I had at least. Um, and they were generally quite good. You know, the prompt was open in many ways. It was designed to just give you space to think about COVID. And if you did that, and cited Gleeg and cited Van Schaik, then you got a good grade. You know, um, a lot of a lot of A's, A minuses, B B pluses. So really, I don't think there's a single C. Um, so across the board, I don't think there's even a B minus. So across the board, people pretty much. If again, if you did it, then uh, you got uh, a good grade on it. Um, so it was pretty straightforward. Hopefully, you uh, gained from it. Um, again, it was secretly getting you to just think about what is modernism, what is magic, how do they compare to each other. Um, some folks kept it kind of academic and just said, you know, science and logic and rationality and all that sort of stuff. Fine. Uh, some people got a little personal. Some people got creative. That was more fun for me to read. Um, but, you know, that n neither of those really affected your grades. In the end, I think people did quite a good job. Uh, today we're going to talk about this Nang Nang. As you can tell, it's a very short reading, very very straightforward in a way. It, it's um, focusing on a story that if you haven't read yet, I will encourage you to read. Um, it's not even actually terribly long, but just to get a sense of what the story is. Uh, where does it begin? I think... The... Well, anyways, I, I'll, I'll, I, I've got it on the slides. We can come to it together uh where is it I expect it's more of this i think it's after that isn't it oh no there it is it's very short 124 to 127 so it's summarized there make sure you read that um i encourage you to watch the movie too you can do extra credit on it and then uh from here we'll have one more lecture next week and then the exam so i will prepare a review sheet for you probably before like just before next class. I don't think I'll do it right now because I don't think that'd be very helpful for you. But I do want to give it to you before next class so we can do some review next class and then the following class. Just like before, we'll have a short uh, discussion part and then take the exam. So um, it's actually not for a couple weeks, April 13th, but it is starting to come. And like I said, I've sent the extra credit to you. And so if you want to wait until you take the exam and to see how you do, you could also do that, whatever you want. It's not due until the 22nd. So you'll have more time to think about the extra credit. Um, the reason I'm bringing it up now, though, is it is tied to the story of Nana. So we've got kind of a lot going on. Um, it's the end of the semester or the second half of the semester. And eventually we'll just read this book. Make sure you get this book, Novice to Master. We'll read that, you'll write a paper, and then we'll be done. So that's that's kind of what's left. I'll, I'll, of course, remind you of this again down the line, but just so we're on the same page now, um, you can start thinking about studying for the exam, start thinking about extra credit. Those are all good things to do now. So just a review of last time, like we normally do, this should be pretty familiar to you by now because you just wrote a, a short paper about it. So what is Buddhist modernism? One challenge in the paper was to actually put this succinctly, right? Because Anne Glee, one, one strength of, of her writing style is she's very skilled at bringing in many different presentations of modernism, presentations of what this is and what its various characteristics are. Um, but in doing so, it's kind of overwhelming. It's easy to get kind of lost in the weeds. So what I hoped you were able to do is zoom out a little bit and say, okay, this is what they all have in common. This is what Buddhist modernism is about. And I thought this list is pretty good, right? There's this sense of there's an original or pure teachings of the Buddha. 
and that is what we want to get to. All the cultural stuff is extra, it's just cultural baggage. Uh, and so that's how Buddhist modernism presents itself. But as you probably also saw, Gleig is very critical of this approach. She's saying that you actually lose a lot of community support and community networks by presenting it this way. And there's a danger of entering into, let's call the, the racial hegemony of America, you know, where um, there's a sense like I'm the professor, I have the original pure teachings of the Buddha and my teachings are much better than anybody else who doesn't have them, right? So there's sort of a power dynamic that develops from this, this way of thinking. Um, attempt at science, uh, attempt at meditation becomes central and there are also various reforms, gender equality and so forth. So all of these things are happening all at the same time over the 20th century and into the 20th, 21st century. And the key uh, example of this really is something like Headspace, right? That, that meditation app program that we were listening to. It, it's sort of this boiled down original pure meditation teaching. It's so original and pure, it's not even Buddhist anymore. Even the Buddhism is gone, right? It's only science. And so a lot of you bought into that and said, yeah, we like science, we like Headspace. And so, uh, and so that's fine. But as you can tell, what I'm trying to do in this class is also give you a chance to think beyond that, right? To think about Buddhist magic and this book of spells and all this sort of stuff. Um, one thing that will be important for class going forward, and especially for the extra credit, maybe actually now is a good time to look at that with you. See, so many things are going on, extra credit. Um, this is, it's basically just, I said, write uh, a little paper, watch this movie, write a little paper, do a little analysis, right? So that's what this is all about. But one thing I bring up here is we've got the village monk, we've got the Buddhist wizard, and we've got the adept. And these figures show up in Nangna. And so if you watch the whole thing, actually at the beginning, they're not so important. It's mostly just lay people. If you note here, lay society. Do you remember the word lay people? That was on the first exam, right? I made you memorize it. So hopefully you still remember what that means. And for our purposes, it just refers to anyone who's not a monk or a nun, right? A lay person. So most of this movie is from the perspective of lay people. And that's why um, we see a side of Buddhism that we don't necessarily see all the time. It's a, it's a ghost movie. It's a ghost story, let's say. It's a film of love and horror. It is also a horror film. There's gore and blood and nasty things. So if you don't like that sort of stuff, maybe you don't want to watch it. Um, and if you do want to do extra credit, but you don't like horror movies, then we can come up with an alternative as well. So anyways, this is due down the line. And it kind of builds on this model where in Buddhist society, there's the Buddhist scholar, there's the Buddhist wizard, and there's the Buddhist adept. Um, so the scholar is usually a monk. They're usually celibate, uh, which of course means they don't have wives. Um, they usually read and write books. They live in a monastery. And again, this is kind of like me, right? Obviously I'm not a monk, but I'm the modern version of this. I read and write books. I live in a university. No, I don't actually live in a university, although it feels that way sometimes, particularly this year. <laughs> you know, It's been hard to live a life beyond that. Um, and so in any case, with you know, Buddhist modernism, the Buddhist scholar, again, has turned into somebody like me who does Buddhist studies. Now there are other figures, right? There's the Buddhist wizard, who's called a vidyadhara, a knowledge holder. They're usually a lay person. They are not celibate. So uh, here's an example one, we'll talk about him in a moment. And they're the ones who do these magical instructions. Actually to zoom in, I think I have to close that, but I like, I like zooming in, so let's zoom. So here's a guy named Padmasambhava, we could spend a lot of time thinking about this image. Um, I, I'll just tell you this, these robes, even though you might think like maybe the monk's robes, they're much more ornate, right? There are all these patterns on them. These are the robes of a lay person, right? This is the dress of a lay person. I, I could ask you, does he look like a wizard? And you might say, no, his hat is not nearly pointy enough, but he does have a pointy hat, right? So this is what a Buddhist wizard looks like, in fact, and he has uh, he has wives. These are two of his wives, a Tibetan wife and an Indian wife. Um, and he's a very famous figure in Tibetan Buddhism in particular. He's probably the single most famous 
Buddhist wizard, certainly in Tibet and maybe anywhere. His name is Padmasambhava, which means lotus born. Um, maybe we can find another picture of him. So I didn't put that in the slide. There's this famous statue of him that we could look at. Yeah, this one this is pretty cool. Um, so here, you know, as you can see, it's a very big statue, right? Here's like a house and here's like another house. He's, he's enormous. Um, and it's just another image of him. Same kind of pointy hat. This time his staff is much more clear and they're like severed heads on it and skulls and stuff. You can see it's on fire. He's holding a Vajra, remember Vajras? Um, so the symbol of power and transformation. He's sitting in a meditative posture. His eyes are very big. This is kind of a sign of a certain practice that he's doing called settling the mind in its natural state. It's actually very similar to Zen practice. So when we read this book, Novice to Master, we'll actually see some things kind of like this. We're not gonna do it, of course, but um, it's, uh, it's parallel, it's, it's related. And um, yeah, so he's, he's a very important figure in Tibetan Buddhism. These are all different images of him, Padmasambhava, very famous all over the place, um, very important for Tibet and Bhutan and many surrounding areas even today. Um, so he, again, is this celebrated Buddhist wizard. It goes to show that these practices didn't disappear, although they do kind of transform. Um, they become a, li a little bit more philosophical, a little less like, you know, if you make a frog out of flour, then you can cure leprosy or something like that. Uh, and a bit more like do this meditation and you'll achieve enlightenment. So even this, this category of the Buddhist wizard does transform. And what you end up with is this figure that's kind of in the middle. They're usually a monk, but they don't have to be. And they focus on meditation and ritual. So rather than the magic stuff where it's like I recite the spell and something crazy happens, the Buddhist adept develops these powers for themselves through sustained meditation practice, right? So let's say I, I want to be able to see into the future. I'm not necessarily gonna do the, the divination ritual that we saw in the book of spells, but what I could do is meditate on various practices to open up this power and try to develop it that way. So it, it takes a lot of the, let's say the technology, the techniques of the Buddhist wizard, but it kind of combines them with the celibate monastic scholar. And what you end up with is something in between, this Buddhist adept who is both a monk and a meditator. Uh, and so there's no uh, conflict between the two. And again, we'll see one of these, actually we'll see all three of these in Nangna. So that's one reason I want you to watch that movie. Um, we don't have to go through this. A lot of you wrote about this. Well, all of you wrote about this in your papers. Um, some of the things you focus on, almost everybody loved writing about the, uh, the stabbing the insane person. It might be because it was the first one, but it was also sort of violent and provocative. We talked about it in class quite a bit. So most people focused on that. Others, um, for some reason, people like Brikuti. I'm not sure why, but a few folks focus on that. There are a lot of things nobody talks about. So. Um, I don't know what that says. Maybe you guys are just busy and, or maybe you all just happen to love the first spell for some reason. Uh, but um, I do encourage you to be familiar with this whole corpus because as we saw from the last exam, it's all fair game, you know, and just because you all happen to write about the same one spell doesn't mean it's going to be the other one that shows up on the exam. Um, really nobody wrote about this one. We talked about it last time. So maybe it, we don't have to go into it too much. If we were together, I would sort of, we could spend some time looking at this. Maybe I'll, I'll try to simulate it now, but you know, can you tell what this is made out of? Um, if you look carefully, sort of looks like Play-Doh. Can you see that? And maybe the word Play-Doh uh, has become so transformed, it's hard to think what does that even come from? But it comes from Play-Doh, like D-O-U-G-H. I think it's spelled with D-O-H or just D-O, I forget. But um, it comes from the idea of a dough, right? And how do you make dough? Is you mix flour and water. In this case, these are called offering cakes, as you can see that. And so if you think about what's in a cake, flour is in a cake. What else is in a cake? Butter is in a cake. And so these ornaments here are actually sculpted out of butter. And this flour is roasted barley flour. So this is a very specific um project that is very specific to tibet because in tibet you have 
this sort of high high altitude barley that's that's common for people to eat roasted turned into a flour and then eaten actually something very similar to what these cakes look like you can make it into a little ball and just eat it straight up eat it with some tea or something like that and then butter is important too because there are many nomads in tibet and so of course butter comes from milk and milk comes from yaks actually they're called g in tibetan language so female yaks um and so these offering cakes are the food that people eat, the food that people create. And so to offer them, uh, there, there is a sense like, it's almost like you're sharing food with someone or something. And so we might think, who are we sharing it with? Or what are we doing with this food? Um, so the ritual, again, we, we, we talked about this last time and maybe we don't need to go into too much detail. I, I, the, the only reason I bring it up is because no one actually wrote about it and I don't want you to forget these things. Um, but it, there's a, as you can see here, you, you tie this thread to the sick person. It's almost like you're drawing the disease out from the sick person, bringing it into the offering cake and throwing the cake into the road. Um, I think I told you last time, this was is something that people still do, right? When you're in, when I was in Lhasa, this particularly in central Tibet in Eastern Tibet, you don't see it as much, but in central Tibet, people still do this kind of thing. Um, when I was in Lhasa people would do this sort of practice. There'd be cakes like this or boxes of weird dolls and stuff in the middle of the road. And um, taxi drivers would go out of their way to run them over, right? And so if you think about what's going on, we are reifying, this is something I think I might've said before, but I didn't necessarily look it up for you. Reify, it means to thingify, right? It comes from the Latin word for res re i rem, right? It's a thing. So it's to make something into a thing. So we're reifying the disease. We're turning it into a thing. We're extracting it from the person, putting it in the cake, and then destroying it. So again, a lot of the, the papers weren't quite able to lay out this logic. Um, and that, you know, that's fine. Maybe it's difficult to understand. Uh, I, I think the, the papers that said, oh, this is just it's not rational, it's not scientific. I think you're selling yourself short. It, it, it's quite rational. Uh, it's just happens to be a rationality that you don't understand, right? So uh, try to understand. Doesn't mean you have to do it, but try to understand what's happening here, right? We're taking a disease, very difficult, very frustrating. It's totally relevant to us today. COVID is a disease that's very difficult, very frustrating. We're reifying it, drawing it out of a person and destroying it. Very logical, makes total sense. Uh, again, th does that mean it really happens? That's not the question you need to be asking here, right? What you need to be asking is how does it feel, right? How does it feel to be the sick person having this disease pulled out from you? Um, and again, you, in our case, we don't even have to have COVID to be frustrated, right? The, the COVID pinata, somebody wrote about that. Um, there's something similar happening here too. We reify COVID all the time. Uh, we reify to 2020. Right, and we pretended like once 2020 is over, then all of a sudden everything will get better. So whether you recognize it or not, just because it's happening in a meme doesn't mean you're engaging it. It doesn't mean you're not engaging in these same sort of activities. Maybe if this were a meme, it would be more palatable for folks. But um, one one reason I'm I'm harping on this so much is because this happens in our own lives, whether we see it or not. We might be able to sort of put our heads up and pretend like we are very modern people and we don't do this kind of crap. But in the reality you do and you you it's important to recognize that you do um so this one we talked about before i i'll save the details some people did write about this one this is also made out of the barley flour so again flour is showing up um some people said you know this there's no medical element to this that's patently false right so these are ointments ointments are medical you're getting some sort of medicinal substance and putting it on the skin of a patient this is what doctors do now when you have a skin problem or at least some uh some types of skin problems will be treated with ointment so there is a medical element to this even though it feels magical you know open your eyes and see what's going on right it doesn't tell us what the ointments are but some sort of medicinal treatment is happening here. But there's also this Naga thing, this dragon thing. And the reason I, I want to focus on this today is actually, if you read the reading for today, Nang Nak, you would see that this name Nak, N-A-A-K, I'll just write it here, N-A-A-K, is, is a very similar word to Naga, 
Uh, it has a similar vowel sound, nah. The double A, it just means it's not knack, right? If it looked like that, you might think it's knack, but it's just, it's knock. And the ka and the ga, uh, the ga of naga and the ka of nak uh, are related sounds. They both come from back here. So some people say nang nak is just a reformulation of these serpent spirits of these dragons that she is some kind of dragon lady and so we'll we'll get to that but one thing to keep in mind is the dragons cause disease and so we need to tame these dragons something we talked about last time is how a frog kind of looks like a dragon right um okay that's enough of that this one i think we covered this pretty well you put the person's name on a piece of paper also pretty interesting right the disease causing spirits get attracted to the name on the paper and you can kind of trap it again reifying disease manipulating the disease based on that reification but then finally the pregnancy ritual i don't think anybody wrote about this either some people mentioned it very very briefly but th this is another very powerful one right that um here is a vulnerable challenging difficult part of anybody's life but particularly a woman's life uh, when a woman is pregnant, there are many dangers that could befall her. And so this is trying to help people feel protected. Um, there's this talk of vows. These goddesses come to try it. They vowed to help protect pregnant women. And then um, there are also the bad demons who try to attack you. So it presents a world where there are good goddesses who protect you and bad demons who try to hurt you. And you can fight back, right? Rather than being powerless and again i think that's one key theme that we could have drawn out from this assignment is rather than just being powerless in the face of covid or powerless in the face of losing a pregnancy these give us these rituals give us tools to fight back right they give us tools to do something about it um and again i think i you know i i put this sort of tongue in cheek but we've had many shootings many violent attacks racist attacks against asian people in particular um this comes from a place of powerlessness, right? When, when these uh, deranged people feel um, like there's nothing they can do to control their lives, they just say, I'm gonna go out and hurt somebody, right? And I, if that's what you gotta do, how about you just hurt like an offering cake, right? That's, that, it's much better to attack this thing than a living human being, right? Throw all of your demons here and crush them, go for it. Why does it have to be a person? Uh, and, and one thing I think this highlights, too, is this is a lot like a scapegoat ritual. Maybe you've heard of scapegoats before. Scapegoat, right? Um, and so uh, usually this, this language is used in, in English to, to refer to um, a person who's been attacked, right? So we could blame Trump for all of his COVID failures. And now that he's gone, we could have a sense, yeah, that COVID will go with him. And that wouldn't even be totally incorrect. But at the same time, it also, um, it highlights kind of the ritualized nature of, of blame, of the way we think about blame. And so when an entire race of people are blamed, which again, is a very American way of approaching the world, then there's violence and attacks along with that blame. So why don't we blame something immaterial? Why don't we blame a demon? Why don't we blame a ghost? Why don't we blame a cake? And then we don't have to attack real people, right? So it, it, it seems like this is all superstition and this is useless, but as you can tell, I'm trying to kind of bring it back for you and show that there might be some use for this kind of thinking. Obviously this is a thousand year old book of spells. We don't have to you know, go back and make any frog uh, sculptures out of paste. But I do think this kind of thinking, this creative, ritualized kind of thinking could uh, provide some solutions to us in our age of, of violence and frustration. So um, obviously, if you have questions about this, I'm happy to talk about it more. There's a, a bit of a review, but the, the Nong Nok stuff is really short. So why don't we jump into this? So what, what is Nong Nok all about? Um, Again, uh, let's start with the name. So we've seen this name before. What does it mean? It's Miss Nuck. It's the Lady Nuck. Uh, so some people call her My Nuck. Some people call her Nang Nuck. Sometimes it's a double A. Sometimes it's a single A. Her husband is named Mak, uh, Nai Mak. So I know Nuck and Mak sound very similar. And I apologize if that confuses you. But they're really the only characters, in addition to some monks who I don't think ever get named. Actually, the one in the movie does, his name's Somdet To, but he's 
he's another very famous monk that we won't talk about in class. Um, know the story, right? I'm not going to tell it to you um, in, in all of the detail. The best way to know the story is to watch the movie. And so that is something I encourage you to do. But uh, very simply put, there's a war. The man, Muck, he is conscripted. He's taken away from his loving wife and unborn child. Right? She's pregnant. He goes to war. He comes back. And he meets with his wife. And they live happily ever after, right? No, uh, he does meet with his wife. But it turns out she's not really his wife. What happened is she had died in childbirth, which, of course, is very common even in the United States. I wouldn't say it's common, but it does happen, right? It does happen. It still happens. Again, very dangerous moment. Um, and so uh, they're reunited. Mock does not know that she is a ghost, right? The husband does not know that his wife is a ghost or that his child is a ghost. And so he loves them. And, you know, spoiler alert, if you watch the movie, it, the movie kind of unfolds really nicely. People try to warn him. And then she gets angry because she doesn't want other people to know that she's a ghost and she kills people, right? So she, it's coming from a place of, we could say, um, devotion to her husband. She doesn't want to be separated from him. That's why she's a ghost in the first place. But at the same time, she's killing people and it's very violent. And so then the end of the movie, maybe I'll leave that uh, unspoiled so you can you can watch or or of course read it to to figure out how it ends buddhism comes in to deal with the the unruly spirit and you can you can see how that goes so um one reason we're focusing on this is this is important in modern day thailand so bangkok is in thailand um here's a shrine that is in bangkok so let's uh let's check it out i'll get the sound actually the sound i think is just song so Let's see, optimize video clip. And this is sort of a, you know, I'm just, this is sort of a, you know, an informal video. I sort of like it though, because it's almost like we are going there. Look at this very happy lady selling some stuff, right? I have been to Thailand. I haven't spent too much time there. Um, but this is kind of what temples look like outside. You have these tents and, um, people selling stuff. You have tourists coming, you have pilgrims and faithful people. Um, and then inside the shrine, you have kind of auspicious things hanging around. These are flowers and colorful garments and stuff. And here is Nung Nuk, or they call her Mai Nuk here. People are making off offerings of incense. Here are images of Nanak. Here are dresses that people offered to her. Here is kind of her main statue. Offerings of water or, or candles. Here's her child, of course. Various other images of her, but this seems to be the main, the main statue. And you know, she's beautiful, right? The, that is an important part of this story is she's kind of a young, beautiful woman. He's offering some money. Let's see, where does he put it? He puts it in her hand, I think. What a, a daring move. She can watch TV. And so that's significant, right? Because she's being treated as if she's a real presence there, right? Other beautiful renderings of her, her and her child. Um, she's being treated as if she's a real presence, right? This isn't just some statue of her. This is her, right? And when you go to visit her, you are visiting this ghost. And when you make offerings, you're offering money to this ghost. And here seems to be a special tree that I think even in the reading, the reading talks about this temple. So hopefully this video gives you a little sense of what the temple looks like. You can ask for lucky numbers. And I believe... This is Nang Nak, these, these beautiful women. There's a sense that she might give you some luck, some lucky numbers. Here's Ganesh. If you don't know him, he's a Hindu god of fortune with the elephant head. Uh, and then there's also Buddhas, right? So it goes to show this is, it's kind of everything's there. You got some Buddhas, you got some ghosts, you got some Hindu deities, you got some tarot card reading. And this is an interesting comparison too, is Guan Yin. I am sure <laughs> this is Guan Yin, uh, and it's a Chinese deity, right? So it, it's um, Guan Yin is a Chinese word. So to see this more benevolent deity here together with Nang Nak also is, I think, worth 
worth considering. Um, there's a little bit more, but I think we're, we're done here. So obviously, if we were together, uh, we could discuss these things because we are not. You can just listen to me and my takes. Um, why do people make these offerings? Well, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. You, you know, incense, flowers, garland, fresh fruit. We saw um, dresses, right? You can see these dresses underneath the portraits. Um, it's almost like giving a gift to a beautiful young woman, right? Or just any young woman. Uh, and similarly, there are gifts for the baby, toys and diapers and bottles of milk, um, like giving a gift to a baby. So unlike offerings you might make to Guan Yin, for example, these are much more specific, right? It feels like a gift you are giving to a real person. And again, I emphasize that the feeling, the expression that people have and make when they go to this temple is like visiting a real person. Um, people pray to avoid military conscription. Maybe that's obvious, but uh, Nang Nak, her husband was, she was taken away from her husband. Her husband was taken away from her because of these wars. And so people who are being separated due to war will turn to her and look for help. And there's sort of an ambiguous role regarding fertility. Um, I think I didn't see any obvious signs like pray to her to have a child. We talked about with Guan Yin, that is the case, right? You do pray to Guan Yin to have a child. So it's, it's worth considering why not? Why are expectant mothers advised to avoid visiting her? And I think the answer is she's more of a figure of death. She represents something uncomfortable. She's a woman who's died in childbirth. She's a ghost, she's violent, right? And these are all details that are a little unsettling, especially if somebody like a pregnant woman is looking for life, right? Or even a, a, somebody who wants to be a mother if they're looking for life. Um, visiting this ghost, this, this, this representation of death would not, uh, it, it would not cross very nicely. So you're supposed to kind of keep those, keep those separate. Um, one thing I skipped is this idea of animism. Maybe you saw even in this reading, there's this sense like, okay, there's like an essential Buddhism, then there's an animism, a popular religion for the, for the masses. And hopefully I, but he probably didn't have this reaction. But when I was reading, I was like, oh, come on, she's falling into the same trap again. Um, but it, it goes to show how deep this Buddhist modernism has gone, right? Things that are not philosophical, that are not the sort of essential, original teachings of the Buddha get treated as if they're somehow extra. But I would argue this is Buddhism, right? Maybe we could say it's Buddhist magic. Maybe we could say it's something else, but it's definitely Buddhism. And so that's why we're talking about it in our Buddhist class. Um, She's a spirit, lovelorn ghost. That's the name of a, it's the name of a book I read over the summer that inspired me to teach about this. Uh, lovelorn is a nice word, you know, um, it, 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 it captures her feeling, right? It's somebody who is sort of heartbroken and separated from their love. You can look it up if you want the details on that one. Um, she's a specific kind of spirit. Again, we learned that in the reading. Um, many spirits who suffer violent death come back as ghosts. And maybe the, there, again, there's a logic here, even if you don't agree with it, there's a logic here that's worth thinking about. You know, if you're preparing for death, you're thinking about death, then when death comes, you're not surprised, right? It's like, okay, I'm dead. I'll just go to my next life. Um, but in this case, she was not expecting to die. She was expecting to have a child, right? It makes me think of um, that movie, Soul. Do you guys know that movie? The, like the Pixar movie, right? The dude was just walking, he falls down a hole and he dies and his soul is separated from him. And it's sort of like whimsical and hilarious and stuff, but like, that's a death right there. It's not, it's not really seen as one, but and he's sort of surprised when he is he, separated from his body. But yeah, we're talking about death there, right? And it, again, just in sort of a Pixar kind of way. And so something similar is happening here. When somebody is surprised by their death, there's a sense they might stick around or if they want to seek vengeance, if somebody has done wrong to them, murdered them, or done something bad to them, then there's a sense that those ghosts will be uh, dangerous too. But this is saying this, this uh, I, be I believe you pronounce P, P Tai Hong, um, is the most vicious of fiends, especially women who die painfully in childbirth with the baby still undelivered. And again, we can think about, you know, 
what does it feel like to give birth to a child? I don't know what, I don't know the answer to that. Maybe I never will know. Actually, in fact, I almost certainly will not know in this life. Um, but at the same time, I could imagine, right? It's difficult. It's transformative. Your body has grown. There's this little being inside of you. And then all of a sudden they come out and then they're separated, but they're also, you want to keep them close, right? So it's this very emotional, very powerful moment. And for somebody to die in that moment, would be utterly devastating, right? Utterly devastating. And in this case too, Nang Nang is so attached to her husband, right? She misses her husband dearly. And that is another thing that keeps her attached to this world. So when we think about her as this is a duality, I feel like um, Sophie put it really nicely, either in class or in writing, I don't even remember. She talked about Freud, but here's kind of that same concept. We have the good wife, or mother versus the evil seducer or monster. We've seen both of these, right? Um, the Buddha's aunt, Gotami, she was sort of the good mother figure. She's very kind to the Buddha. The evil seducer, we saw Mara's daughter. So both of these are operating in the Buddhist world. Um, and it's worth thinking about which one, which one best describes Nanna. Or maybe as you're thinking about it, Guan Yin is pretty easy. She's good, right? She's not evil. She's just all good. Um, when we saw the images of Guan Yin, the statue is very sort of soft and kind and all these sorts of things. The statue of Nan Lai was a little, a little unsettling. I don't know about you guys. I find it a little bit creepy. This whole subject is a little creepy, which maybe is all the more reason to talk about it. But um, now you've had plenty of time to think about it. Nan Lai is really both. She's both the good wife, mother, and she's also the evil seducer, monster. She's quite literally a monster. She's a ghost, right, who is murdering people, so clearly evil. She even seduces Mach a little bit in the sense that she tricks him, right? She tricks him with her love, um, but she, she pretends that she's a living person when she's actually a ghost. Um, but at the same time, she's also a good mother. She loves her her child. I don't know if we learned if it's a boy or a girl, it doesn't really matter. She loves her child. She takes care of the child. She dies for her child in a way, right? Because of the child. Um, and she's also totally devoted to her husband. That's one thing that comes very, comes through very clearly. And again, this is a patriarchal world. We've talked about that before. And from a patriarchal perspective, I think one thing that men really value most is this kind of devotion, is that she will be there for him. And she is so devoted. She is there for her husband, even beyond the grave, right? So she's a great mother. She's a great wife, uh, but she's also evil monster, all, all wrapped up in, into one. So the, the, the love-hate complex that Wong is talking about here, that, that's a nice way to think about it. They really both show up in the case of Nanma. Um, she challenges cultural expectations. And so she confronts monks. Uh, monks are supposed to be kind of the highest authority. We talked about patriarchy, but she actually challenges monks and she even wins, right? Not all the time necessarily, um, but it's totally out of place for her to be so powerful and be so audacious to take on a monk like that. And yet she does it. Um, and again, very skillfully and very powerfully. Uh, and so she, again, she almost represents the symbol of power for women, right? Where if men treat her right and approach her well and give her the right offerings, men in particular, um, then, you know, she'll look out for them. But at, at the same time, she's also kind of, there's a latent threat here where if you don't propitiate her, if you don't make offerings to her, she might seek revenge. And this, of course, uh, could be in the form of violence. So she, again, is this complicated figure challenging social expectations of wisdom. An interesting question is, is she a feminist symbol, right? Or is there something feminist about this story? Uh, you know, I think we could have a conversation about that. I, I think there are elements where you could say yes, there are elements where you could say no. Um, another way to think about her, as I mentioned before, is she is kind of this dragon spirit um, these dragons, the Nagas, there is a sense they're connected to rain, 
also fertility, but then they can also cause disease. They're kind of capricious spirits that live underground and um, could cause problems for us, but could also help us depending on how we treat them. And so Nang Nak, uh, Nang Nak embodies that in a way, right? She is potentially dangerous, but also potentially helpful, potentially a bringer of fortune and good luck and that sort of thing. And then finally, this was the concluding section of the reading. Again, it was very short, very straightforward, which is one reason we're not going to devote in a whole class to this because it would just it would drag by the end of it. Um, there's this allure of dangerous love, right? So I, the, the mermaid, the little mermaid story is actually quite similar to this. The little mermaid is also kind of a serpent type figure coming up from the underworld in order to marry a human. Um, there's the lad and the serpent lady. This is more of a Chinese story. I think it's on Netflix, something about like tale of the white serpent. I started watching it. I, I wasn't really into it, but, uh, it's out there somewhere. So this is also a Chinese story where the serpent figure, the Naga, the dragon gets married to a human. So again, it's kind of a common theme where there's almost like a power and a fertility and a, an allure again, that comes from these forbidden loves, but then there's also danger, right? And then finally, the Beauty and the Beast, that's the Disney one. We, I think we all know that one. Um, so yeah, here, this is basically the upshot of the story. The fact that she is a woman is significant, right? And we have to think about it. The fact that she is a ghost is significant. That's another thing to think about. So there are all these kind of interesting um, symbols that all get tied up in this one figure. And then finally, Buddhism comes to the rescue. Here's a very famous scene where Nang Nak is on the ceiling of the monastery holding her child and the village monk is looking up at her freaked out, right? Um, maybe I will just pose these as questions rather than answer them for you. Because again, this is something you can write about in your extra credit. Um, and this is something we can discuss more next class. So maybe I'll, I'll just pose these questions and leave it open. This is kind of the upshot, right? Because um, the whole Nanak story is mostly about secular society. It's this lay well, secular is not the right word, but it's a lay practice. It's for lay people. And then now Buddhism starting to come in. Wong says Buddhism is the only remedy for the untamed woman, the ultimate refuge for the jeopardized man. Um, I think that's definitely one way to read it. And it's worth thinking about why, right? So how, how does Buddhism tame the untamed woman? How does Buddhism provide a refuge for the man who's in danger? Uh, how does Buddhist philosophy come in? So Four Noble Truths, Karma, Craving, Suffering, that is part of the story, isn't it? Uh, and so it's worth thinking about what, what role do these play? And then Buddhist magic, there's a little bit of that. There's an exorcist kind of figure who tries to deal with Nang Nak. And so there's a bit of a commentary on exorcism and Buddhist magic. And then finally, it's just worth thinking about what does this tell us, right? If I'm a lay person, and I hear the story, what is the message? What, what is the moral of the story? And it's not totally clear. So it, it's something we'll, again, we'll have to discuss, we'll have to think about. Um, and finally, this is really the million dollar question is who has the power to protect us from these dangerous spirits? Is it the monk, the wizard or the adept? Um, there's a, we could watch a scene from the film. I think I'll, I'll hold off on that for now because you could watch the whole thing if you want to. And maybe we can discuss specific scenes when we get together next time. Um, but yeah, so this is the extra credit question. What does the tale of Nanak tells about the role of Buddhism in, in lay society? So I want you to think, what does this tale do for lay people? What does it tell us about love, relationships, uh, motherhood, fatherhood, sex, um, attachments, but then also Buddhism and how Buddhism can kind of help us with all of these complexities. Uh, danger and safety and all this sort of stuff. So lots of lots of different takes, lots of different approaches. I hope um, you're, you are able to watch the film. The YouTube version is not great quality, but it's there. And then the Netflix version is better quality, but you have to pay for it. So hopefully you can do either one of those, take your pick. Um, and again, you don't have to do extra credit. You don't have to watch this, it's up to you. And um, if you have time, feel free to take the rest of class to watch this because we're gonna close things up now. Have a good Easter break. 
uh, we'll get back together one week from now at the end of the Easter break, and then we can discuss Nang Nak and move on into the rest of the course. Okay, so um, I hope you found this story interesting. And of course, as always, let me know if you have any questions. Okay, take care, everybody.